It was 1991 and I was in the last year of my military service. I remember it well. Because in addition to having devoted my life to God, I also intensified my pursuit of the life of the mind. And one night after I had fallen asleep with the television set on, sometime between 1 and 4 a.m., I woke to the voice of this passionate intellectual who was just asked a question about the development of the Protestant Reformation. And as I listened to him scope the development of the Protestant Reformation as only Cornell West can, mentioning Lutheranism, reform, radical reform, and the counter-reform movement, I thought to myself, rubbing my eyes, who is this man? And I must admit, I was captured more by the magnetism of his personality than I was by the brilliance of his thought, because I didn't understand a lot of what he was saying. <laughs> I was working on my own vocabulary. But as I've come to understand Cornel West, I've come to this conclusion. That it is not often that one meets a philosopher with a blues sensibility. And I'm convinced that Cornel West has a blues sensibility because he comes, first of all, from a blues people. It is for this reason I consider it a privilege to be able to introduce you to one of America's most provocative public intellectuals who has been a champion for racial justice since childhood and as race transmogrified into class, he maintains his critique because he understands that the African American experience sits at the heart of the American experience and American democracy in a way that calls into question not just justice for black people, but justice for all people. And he weaves this, his writing and speaking and teaching, through the grand Christian prophetic tradition, progressive politics, blues, jazz, and funk. You can't forget the funk. <laughs> and in doing so, his thinking is not just abstract intellectual arguments about theories and syllogisms and the modernity of postmodern people. No, what Cornel West demonstrates, that simply because you are in the ivory tower, your thinking does not have to be ivory tower-ish. Whoever said you can't be affiliated with the university as a scholar while simultaneously being a voice for the oppressed has never met Cornel West. He says it this way, I resist professional incorporation even as a highly visible voice in the academy. In fact, he says that the aims of professionalism professionalism in the academy are to conceal the funk, both the funk of America and the funk of life on the underside of America. I love that. <laughs> and this critique, folks, I want you to get it, that it emerges from a person that who has not only been educated in, but who has taught at some of the most prestigious schools in America's history and beyond. Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Union Theological Seminary, the University of, Pre of Paris. But watch this, also in prisons, adult education, and workers' schools. In his latest book called Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud, he tells the story of being the first Yale professor to be arrested on Yale property. He was supporting, I love that, he was supporting a 10-week strike by an adequately paid clerical workers who were primarily women. James Cone, the preeminent black theologian, described West in this way. He said that West's solidarity with the black poor undoubtedly influenced him to take the place, to place the problem of suffering at the center of his philosophy. West's concern, he says, is concrete and existential. And he raises this question, he said West raises this question. How do you really struggle against suffering in a loving way to leave a legacy in which people would be able to accent their own loving possibility in the midst of so much evil? He wants us, he wants to encourage people to live without bitterness, without cynicism, and without revenge. I believe Cornel West aspires to be what Dr. Keem called a drum major for justice. But justice born of love for everyday, ordinary people. What he calls world-weary people. A justice that's also born of a vision of the cross of Christ. And he emphasizes this in his own brand, of, not his own brand, but in prophetic Christianity, which calls into question not only the religion of the marketplace, but the religion of the sanctuary. Let me bring it closer home. Not only the religion of the academy, but the religion of the Christian academy. His personal struggle leaves me with this question, which I leave with you. What role will the academy play in the future of America? Will it be life-giving, 
life-sustaining, life-affirming, or will it be something else? As Cornel West would say, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people, and you can't save the people if you won't serve the people. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a philosopher with a blue sensibility, Dr. Cornel West. Oh, that was beautiful. Yes, we are. We're going to have a funky good time. Oh, is it all right, though? I want to thank my dear brother, Professor Raymond Carr. Thank you so much. You spoke from your heart and your soul and your mind. And that's a distinctive feature, among others, of the tradition that produced me. So I very much accept your uh, very kind and generous words. And to have that kind of uh, intense passion and critical intelligence in such a sublime and beautiful place like Malibu is a <laughs> fascinating, tension-ridden juxtaposition. And uh, I, I, I embrace it. I want to, of course, salute the captain of this ship, my very dear brother and new friend, Dean Rick Mars. So give him a hand. Give him a hand. <laughs> but we, we, we share much in common, but one is that he was trained in Near Eastern languages and literature. Got his PhD at the World Center the nearest in languages and literature, John Hopkins in Baltimore City. And uh, my undergraduate degree was in Near Eastern languages and literature of Hebrew and Aramaic and Mesopotamian thought and Judaic thought and the great William Albright, we shall never forget. I was blessed to study it under G. Ernest Wright, who was the grand student of Albright. And so it's fascinating to come from Jersey to Malibu have something deeply in common with the dean. <laughs> and what can I say about Sister Tabitha Jones? My God, give her a hand. <laughs> well, you know how much we love you here at Pepperdine University. It's been eight years now. Well, you were kind enough to bring me then. I was a young man and <laughs> less gray hair. And well, I tell you, I guess it's a matter of perception. <laughs> But I appreciate it. But you were singing in praises then of your uh, gift from heaven, Sister Shelby. It was so good to, to see her. And uh, where is Sister Shelby? Where is she? There she is. Give Sister Shelby a hand, carrying on this rich <laughs> legacy and sitting next to her beloved and blessed grandparents. Give them a hand as well, the grandparents, the mother and father of my, my cold train friend. And talking about Coltrane, I, what can I say about my fellow ju jazz man and my fellow philosopher, my fellow lover of wisdom, and my fellow Princetonian? I'm talking about Professor Nate Clamp. Give him a hand there. Yeah, we've had some good times at Princeton, didn't we? From Stanford to Princeton and now Pepperdine. Boy, you all are blessed to have Brother, what we call Brother Nate, I know he's a professor now, and I don't want to downplay your title. <laughs> but it would always be jazz man, political theorist to me. I want to acknowledge Janet Davis, who was so very kind. Where is her for Janet? Where is she? Where is she? Oh, there she is. Yes. Love your sister, Janet. Appreciate the work. You all may have noticed when I walked in, I walked in with a giant. I met him 26 years ago. He's my baby brother I never had. I'm the older brother he never had. He's a giant in spirit. He's a giant in mind. He's a giant in soul. If you watch his show tonight, you will see he and I go at it for 30 minutes uninterrupted, no commercials. He is a person from Kokomo, Indiana. And he grew up in a trailer with 10 brothers and sisters. And he was just recently selected the 
among the, the 100 most influential people in the world. He has a foundation for young people, just celebrated the 10th anniversary. 500 students every year come through that program. I've been blessed to be with him now for each year. Some of you see the State of the Black Union every February. He has a major exhibition, the art exhibition. It's been in Philadelphia, in Atlanta. It's coming to Los Angeles October the 29th. It's the largest exhibition ever on the grand history, the great struggle. People of African descent in America contributing to the expansion of this very precious yet precarious experiment in democracy. I could go on and on and on, but he is my dear brother, Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley. Brother Tavis Smiley. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. Nobody like Tavis Smiley. I'll tell you that right now. Lord, why don't you go on and on and on? Absolutely. Absolutely. And believe me, I salute each and every one of you tonight. And I've come here to Pepperdine to try to say something that thoroughly unsettles you. And unnerves you, maybe even for a moment unhouses you. Because that's what I'm called to do. I was 17 years old and I decided to be a lover of wisdom, a philosopher of philosophia. And it's a vocation, not just a profession. I didn't just want to be a professional, but I certainly wanted to get paid. I've got loved ones. <laughs> precious daughter and precious son and precious grandson now. But a calling, not just a career. I was responding to the question that each and every one of us must wrestle with. Because we all have a death sentence in time and space. Even when I teach in prison, they say, oh, Brother Wes, how can I deal with this life sentence? I say, I got one, too. I just have a little more freedom than you. Nobody gets out of time and space alive. And your calling and your vocation has to do with what does it mean to be human? You know, our English word human derives from the Latin humando, which means burying. That's where humility comes from in English, visa be the Latin. That's where humanity comes from. What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between urine and feces? That's who we are. I know a brother's coming to talk about Darwin mattering. Christian, I believe, we're made in the image of God. But at the same time, we know we are vanishing creatures and disappearing organisms with bodies who face extinction. Someday, our bodies will be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. Well, I hate to remind the young freshmen that. <laughs> no, you just got here, and I want you to keep a smile on your face for a while. When you come to an institution like Pepperdine, fundamentally committed to what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E -E paideia, deep education, wrestling with what it means to be human, so slowly you begin to shift from the superficial to the substantial, from the frivolous to the serious, from the bling bling, the issues of life and death and joy and sorrow. What kind of human being will you be? What kind of vocation will you have? What kind of calling will you choose or be chosen? And yes, to be a philosopher is in many ways the most serious of vocations because 
Everything is at stake. That's what we love about Socrates when he confronts Rasimachus in the Republic. Rasimachus playing games. Oh, might makes right, of course. Nobody talking about justice, just concerned about the eleventh commandment. Thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Power defines truth. Success defines character. Prosperity defines integrity. What lies? Sheer mendacity. What kind of person are you going to be? Socrates' question to Persimachus. Jesus' question to everyone. Buddha's question. Muhammad's question. Chekhov's question. Shakespeare's question. Toni Morrison's question. But we all begin as our mama's child and our daddy's kid. Very much in my memoirs, I begin there. We all are born under circumstances not of our own choosing. We don't choose mama. God bless you. I know you didn't choose the cough. It just comes, doesn't it? <laughs> it just comes. That's all right. We don't choose our daddies. We don't choose our gender, even though there's some gender bending going on. <laughs> Technology can do it, can't it? <laughs> right? I'm lying now, but it cuts both ways. I'm Leslie, it cuts both ways. But most importantly, it's a matter of wrestling with who you are in your trek from your mother's womb to tomb. And we begin with the love push of our mothers that got us out. That's where the funk begins. That's James Brown and George Clinton. That's Bruce Springsteen and Stephen Sondheim. They're all blues artists because they're concerned with the things that the mainstream like to sanitize and sterilize and deodorize. So I come up here in my three-piece suit and got my, <laughs> hope my tie is looking straight. My white shirt. But you know, I'm just another funky blues man in the life of the mind. Because beneath that suit, beneath that appearance is what? Wounds and scars and bruises, and fears and insecurities and anxieties, just like you all looking deodorized on the surface. But if I could look closely inside of the dark precincts of your own souls, what would I find? Fears. Wrestling with self-confidence, wrestling with self-respect, fighting off self-doubt trying to muster what it takes to matriculate through this grand institution. And even after you graduate, another wave of challenges. PhD degree, law degree. <coughs> Reputation as artist, another set of challenges, the perennial pursuit of wisdom of how to live given the new stages that you will un undergo in your life. And it has everything to do with this pie dea, deep education. Because once you shift in attention and begin to deal with those frightening issues of life and death and sadness and sorrow, there's also a joy because there's a playfulness in being a philosopher. The most serious of vocations, the most playful of dispositions. Why? Because as a fa finite, fallen creature, there's always the chance you could be wrong. Now that might be news to some people. <laughs> Locked into their dogmas and self-righteousness, or they're ready to wear righteousness. Always already a given, as opposed to being vulnerable taking a risk. That's why Plato says philosophy itself is a meditation on and preparation for death. Not just death as an event 
in our lives in space and time, but as a process. The students here at Pepperdine came here in part to learn how to die. Because when you learn how to die, you have to give something up. And there is no rebirth without death. So when you come to Pepperdine, you have certain assumptions and presuppositions. You have to critically, courageously examine them because you may have to give some of them up. And when you give them up, it's a form of death. In order for you to become more mature, when you read Hamlet, and you see the most sophisticated of all modern protagonists in modern literature, Shakespeare, Hamlet himself. And the only ones who go toe to toe and eye to eye and soul to soul are those proletarian grave diggers reflecting on Yorick, that fellow of infinite jest who loved Hamlet so deeply that he never forgot it. And you may take that text and throw it against the wall. You can't take it because maybe you have memories of a loved one whose lived body is now a dead corpse in a coffin. And at that moment, you decide, my God, I see what it means to be human. I've got to now connect the three dimensions of time, past, present, and future. I'm the quick, the dead. What kind of legacy will I leave for those who come after? That can be painful learning how to die. Montaigne, of course, by the greatest of early modern philosophers who happened to be Catholic. And I'm Baptist, so that's fascinating. <laughs> Distance. <laughs> and I learned from my Catholic brothers and sisters, don't let a year go by without reading John Henry Newman's great grandma for sent. Bernard Lonegan. David Tracy, but I'm still Baptist. <laughs> Montaigne says what? To philosophize is to learn how to die. Who has the courage to examine their assumptions and presuppositions, their dogmas and doctrine in such a way that they know they'll, they must retain some, but at the same time they're going to have to give some up. There's no such thing as a human being with no assumptions and presuppositions. You have to have something to proceed from. But you have to put them on the table and begin to interrogate them. So when you leave some of the classrooms here at Pepperdine, I hope you all have that wonderful experience of acknowledging after that lecture or reading that Dostoevsky and Nietzsche that your worldview for the moment rests on pudding. You are completely intellectually discombobulated. That's called deep education. Now you don't want it to last for a lifetime. <laughs> Sooner or later you're going to have to hit some bedrock in order to proceed. But you're shaken. It's an intellectual vertigo. A tragic qualm at the core of who you are that forces you to say, I need to Mature. That's what paideia, and that's what I have been blessed to undergo for 56 years. Now, growing up in Sacramento, California, I was five years old when I first encountered a death shudder. It reminds you of the um, Faust in the realm of the mothers of Goethe's great classic. He shudders and that wonderful line, Goethe says, to be human is to shudder. And my death shudder was, what is it like to be dead, to experience non-existence? I asked my brother that. He said, just have some water and cool off. <laughs> I love my brother. The radical fragility of life and the inevitability of death. See? Knowing at any moment you could go, a loved one could go. I read, as I got older, I read some Kierkegaard. As I got older, I read Samuel Beckett. 
a host of others who wrestle with the death shudder. It's even in David Hume, we don't expect that with many of our Scottish philosophers who tend to be more commonsensical. But after he wrote his great treatise of human nature, nature the greatest work in the English language in his mid-twenties, he had a nervous breakdown. Like Max Weber, after his breakdown, it couldn't function for two and a half years, wrestling with the deaf shudder and other challenges. And for me, that propelled me to try to engage in reading and thinking and conversing about what is this thing called life and being human really all about. I recall my dear Sunday school teacher, Sarah Ray, Shiloh Baptist Church, raising a question. She said, that well, she said, Little Ronnie, that was my name then, Cornell Ronald West, but they called me Little Ronnie in those days. And she said, Little Ronnie, she said, if there was one place left for, in heaven and just two of you and you and Starvell were there, would you take it? Well, she asked Starvell first. He said he would take it. So I said, well, I'm in trouble. <laughs> And I said, no, I'd let Starvale have it. He said, well, why would you do that? Isn't the end and aim of being a Christian to get to heaven? I said, well, heaven is just not a projection of acquisitive desire like we find on earth. So everybody just running a race, trying to outcompete everybody in certain slots, almost casino-like. <laughs> My understanding of being a Christian was to love so radically Beyond the logic of equivalence, not just love thy neighbor like Leviticus 19.18, but the logic of superabundance. Love your enemies. That's what that first century Palestinian Jew named Jesus talked about. I want to love my enemies. I got to let Starvel in. <laughs> I actually like that Negro. And of course, again, she was just raising that issue to get a sense of how do you come to terms with being human, come to terms with the weight and gravitas of caritas, of love, or even agape. She knew it was hypothetical. Now, as I got older, I would say to myself from those wonderful lines of Thomas Stern, Eliot, T.S. Eliot, and the Four Quartets, ours is in the trying the rest. It's not our business. What kind of witness do you bear? The rest is not your business. And if you respond to that question of what it means to be human, linking Socratic spirituality in the form of questioning, 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 learning how to die by critically examining yourself in order to become more mature in forms of assumptions and presuppositions that are subtle and nuanced and powerful. And then the legacy of Jerusalem, which is Isaiah chapter 1, orphan, widow, oppressed, fatherless, but we can go on and on physically challenged, handicapped, those pushed to the margins, those whose humanity radically call into question. It could be blues people, black people, indigenous peoples, brown peoples. It could be white working class brothers and sisters whose suffering is often overlooked. It could be the well-to-do who have a whole host of material things but wrestle with forms of spiritual malnutrition. We've seen that recently. With Brother Michael Jackson, my dear soul brother, had so much wrestling with the emptiness of fame, the vacuity of status and title, need for what that Hebrew scripture calls hesed, loving kindness, do justly, love, mercy, walk humbly with thy God in Micah 6, 8. Connecting Socratic spirituality of questioning with prophetic, be it Judaic, prophetic for me, Christian, 
could be prophetic with our Islamic brothers and sisters who proceed right out of the legacy of Abraham with Muhammad later on. I stand on my own Christian ground, but I'm always open to learn from others. It could be the prophetic witness of agnostic brothers and sisters, like my favorite writer, Anton Chekhov, who has more love flowing in his plays and his short stories than many Christians have flowing in their lives, even if they go to church every week. Still too conformist, too adjusted, well-adjusted to greed, indifference, and fear, rather than mal-adjusted to greed in the face of fairness, mal-adjusted to indifference toward the poor. In the name of compassion, or mal-adjusted to fear. In the name of hope. Much to learn from lapsed Christians like Beckett, or Tennessee Williams, one of my favorite writers in American grain. And similarly so, in terms of the uh, Outright atheists. Now, atheist strikes one's a bit dogmatic, given the sheer mystery of the world and the universe and the magnitude of that mystery. Because there's a sense in which it's hard to find thoroughgoing, consistent atheists. Even Brother Christopher Hitchens, who's been making a lot of noise recently about atheism. He's a dear brother of mine. I've known him for 25 years. And I ask him, Brother Chris, I know you so well. Let's just begin with what you most treasure. And he'll specify it. I won't get into his personal things because I think it's on video. <laughs> <laughs> what do you most treasure? Trot it out. And as a Christian, I will lovingly point out that it could be idolatrous. Because everybody, in the end, treasures something. Could be just your precious gift from heaven. It's not a bad candidate, your lovely little girl, your lovely little boy. But even that is idolatrous if you most treasure some slice of creation, even given your own biological creation. Because will it be able to speak to the deepest needs of your soul, even given that precious relation with that gift from heaven? And that's a different kind of dialogue than what I call undergraduate atheism based on the recent book by Mark Johnston, Saving God's wonderful book to take a look at. Bringing together Socratic spirituality of questioning with prophetic spirituality of bearing witness to love. And one of the things I love about Tavis Smiley is he and I decided years ago that we were going to be true to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer, and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, and Dorothy Day, and Philip Barrigan, and what was distinctive about those folk, brothers and sisters of all colors, that they were willing to talk about love publicly. Love is a steadfast commitment to the well-being of others. Not a sentimental orientation toward the world. It's a willingness to sacrifice. It's a willingness to pay a cost. For Christians, it's about the cross. What does it mean to look at the world through the lens of the cross? That emblem of unearned, of unconditional love and unarmed truth. It takes a tremendous audacity to, but when you actually do, Begin to see the world so radically different than what so many others see when they look at the world. Begin to say, lo and behold, to be human is really about the quality of your love for others and the debt of your service to others and the sacrifice you're willing to pay. Yes, you must survive. Yes, you must engage in a quest for success. But greatness is qualitatively different than worldly success. It's all, oh, Brother West, that's easy for you to say, teaching at Princeton. <laughs> that's for now. One never knows. One never knows. 
in my own life, I think back of the moments where I could have ended up somewhere else. I know when I was teaching at Williams College and the police pulled me over and said, we have finally found the biggest crackhead in upstate New York. <laughs> Took me to jail. I said, you got the wrong Negro. Because <laughs> I knew he was a black man. They're not going to be that far off, you know. <laughs> I mean, arbitrary police power is a dangerous thing. But they had a little subset. They called up the dean. So no, he's giving a lecture on Nietzsche at 3.30. He said, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, we laugh, but that's not funny, because I wouldn't be lecturing here. If there hadn't been some check, I've got at least four or five other stories about that. I won't go into it. Now I'll talk about why I was charged for rape. A white sister, while at Harvard, took me to James jail. Same Cambridge police that were interacting with Skip Gates. <laughs> we won't unpack that term. That's, that's another lecture, isn't it? But arbitrary police power is a dangerous thing for any human being, especially in a democracy. The distinctive feature of democracy is to curtail arbitrary police power, to make police power fair and equal under the law and so forth. And that white sister, three times the police said, you know he's the one. She just shaking. Was it a Negro? Yes. Was it that one? No. Another reason why take seriously bearing witness for truth and justice. I salute that white sister's courage. See, I was in 19 years old. I could end up in jail like so many other black brothers, the brown brothers, anybody else. But arbitrary police power. There's a sense in which there go I but for the grace of God. Oh, but for the grace of God go I. Either way you want to put it. You see, one of the fundamental uh, Things of my life has been one of grace and gratitude. I am who I am because somebody loved me, cared for me so, kept track of me. And I am who I am because God has loved me so. And once I made my, my calling and my vocation real, I could hear in the backdrop Shiloh Baptist Church, we used to sing in the junior church section, Jesus, be a fence all around me. Protect me, guide me, guard me. I know I'm going to go astray, but I want to, I aspire to follow through on vocation and calling. And what does it mean to bring together the Socratic questioning and the prophetic witness? Well, that's in part what the blues is all about. That's why the blues is no plaything. See, Ralph Ellison says the blues is an autobiographical chronicle of a personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. You begin with the catastrophic. You begin with the calamitous, the scandalous, the monstrous. And then you express who you are, your humanity, in the face of that catastrophe. So that the father of the blues, B.B. King says what? Nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's catastrophic, isn't it? Can you imagine what it's like to be in life and feel as if nobody loves you? Holding out for your mama, find out she's been wearing the mask. <laughs> well, that's Antigone, isn't it? That's Sister Antigone. The whole cosmos has called into question your worth. Nobody in your corner. That sounds like the blue note that Jesus echoes in the book of Isaiah, doesn't it? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The most powerful force in the universe has forsaken you. That's the blues, y'all. Well, when Billie Holiday sings about strange fruit the southern trees bear, but our dear Jewish brother Maripol writing those lyrics, 
black body swinging in the southern breeze. You all know that song? You all know who Billie Holiday is? She's from Baltimore City. Oh, yes. But that's catastrophic, isn't it? Jim Crow, Jane Crow, lynching, any form of bigotry. Holy cause for our dear Jewish brothers and sisters. Catastrophic. Greeks pushed out of Turkey. The catastrophe, they call it, of 19, 1922. We can go on and on. Indigenous peoples encountering Europeans, 1492. We discovered, no, we've been here for a while. You ain't discovered nothing. <laughs> you have come. And we say hello. 18 million in place at the time. Disease, conquer, violated treaties. Cryptogenocidal effect. I'm not talking about motivation. Sometimes the motivation was ugly. Sometimes it was unintentional. But the effect, the consequence was catastrophic. Look at that first line of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. Gregor wakes one morning and finds himself transformed into what? A huge, foul vermin. That's catastrophic. I don't recommend it tonight for anybody here. That's Kafka. All of us will encounter catastrophic events in our lives. Part of the genius of Chekhov is that the catastrophic is not just one event like Kafka. The catastrophic is shot through everyday life so there's a steady ache of misery every moment of your life trying to come to terms with who you are. It's called a democratization of the catastrophic. <laughs> it's shot through ordinary lived experience. Even when you think you're experiencing these high moments of joy, it's so tied into pain and sorrow, almost like the great ode of John Keats. They got a movie out now. Shouldn't advertise. Bright Star. Anybody seen that movie yet? Has it hit Malibu yet? <laughs> Keats, negative capability, being in the midst of doubts and mysteries and uncertainties without any irritable reaching to fact and reason. Wrestling with Catastrophic circumstances for Keats, of course, secular. Dead at 25, the greatest poet in the English language in the 19th century. Didn't pick up a pen until he was 21. I don't recommend that for those aspiring to be great poets. <laughs> but Keats pulled it off. <laughs> Blues man in that sense. Stephen Sondheim, the greatest of all figures in the history of musical theater. His mother writes a note that says, there's a good chance that I will die. The doctors tell me there's a 30% chance that I will survive. I only have one thing to say. And he writes, she writes a note to her son. I have no regret in life other than the fact that I gave birth to you. That's Sondheim. That's our greatest playwright in song. Just like our greatest playwright in words felt the same thing about his mother, Eugene O'Neill. Take a look at Long Day's journey in tonight. And his sense that he feels as if his mother giving birth to him was a catastrophic moment, wishing he were never born. He tries to commit suicide. At 21, he fails. He goes to Princeton, Brother Nate, but he only lasts a semester because he's alcoholically inclined. <laughs> but that same Eugene O'Neill wrestling with Catastrophe at every play. The, the ice man cometh. The catastrophe of American civilization. A, a capitalist civilization so obsessed with titillation and stimulation, thinking that one can possess one's soul by possessing commodities. That's what O'Neill was wrestling with. People who don't even realize that they're dealing with catastrophic circumstances because they live in a world of make-believe, like the American Hamlet, like Blanche Dubois and a streetcar named Desire of that white literary blues man, 
born in Mississippi, grew up in New Orleans, called Tennessee Williams. And you all know that play, right? Streetcar Named Desire, Blanche, living in a world of make-believe. Escape from reality, history, mortality, memory. One of the ends and aims of an institution like Pepperdine, fundamentally committed to Paideia, even with a rich Christian backdrop and heritage there, to try to convince each and every one of us to come to terms with blues-like conditions, or come to terms with the funk in our lives, come to terms with the funk in our cities, in our society. You talk about blues people, black folk in America. One of the great gifts, especially in, the, in this age of terrorism, is how do you deal with catastrophic conditions like being terrorized and in responding to those terrorizing conditions don't opt for just counter-terrorizing. That's a great gift. You see, I was just in Istanbul, Turkey a week and a half ago. We were just in Istanbul. Speaking there at the St. Arena Church. The church that was, that began to build that church in 330 A.D. That's right after Constantine is undergoing conversions. Just 18 years after his conversion. You see. And we sat there and said, well, here's a great gift of a blues people to the world in this age of terrorism and recession and depression. That after 244 years of American slavery, it was against the law for black people to worship God without white supervision. In this land of religious liberty, they were like the early Christians in the wrestling in the lion's den with the sense of who they were. They had to steal away at night, hold hands, non-literate but had control of only one thing, their body and their voices. And what did they do? They followed what would be the anthem of a blues people. They lifted their voice and sang. And they sang about what? Socratic questioning of white supremacy. That's the dogma that had to go. And once you let go of white supremacy, it can be a challenge. Just like we brothers, we let male supremacy go. Ooh, what a challenge. Or as Americans thinking that somehow an American baby has more value than a baby in Ethiopia or Guatemala. Let that American chauvinism go in the face of the cross. Every flag subordinate to the cross. What happens when you let certain things go? Well, the blues said you got to let it go. And what did the black folk do in the slavery? They produced people like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. And what did she have to let go? What did he have to let go? The bitterness and the destructive forms of anger. So when they, they faced terror as an enslaved people, they didn't say, we're going to terrorize the folk who are terrorizing us. They didn't say we want to hunt them down like cockroaches when we have guns. They said in the face of enslavement, we want freedom for everybody. And the Jim Crow and Jane Crow, which is a form of terrorism too, American terrorism. Every two and a half days for 50 years, some black child, black woman, a black man hanging from some tree. And in the face of that kind of terrorism, what was the response? Ida B. Wells, what do you have to say teaching Sunday school in Chicago as a freedom fighter? I want liberty for everybody. I don't want to create counter-terrorism against the terrorism we're coming to terms with. That's why there was no black Al-Qaeda formed among Negroes in the face of terrorism. They kept dishing out Socratic and prophetic folk like Martin Luther King Jr willing to die, pick up his cross and be put on the cross, saying, I will never be 
a gangster even as I must deal with the effects of being gangsterized. I won't get down in that gutter. Go back and take a look at that eulogy he gave for those four precious children. 16th Street Baptist Church. They were killed by some sick white brothers and sisters. Killed in Sunday school. First time he cried in public. What did he say? In the face of this kind of terrorism, we've got to muster the courage to fight with love, with justice. It appears impotent, just like Jesus on that cross appeared impotent. But truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Just keep bearing witness, Martin and others. Sooner or later, your truth will be acknowledged. But it's not for you to have control over that. Yours is in the trying. The rest, it's not your business. One life to live. In fact, I tell my white brothers and sisters this all the time. I say, you know, you look at the fusion between the Socratic and the prophetic in the history of American democracy and the ways in which the dominant forms of black leadership have opted for truth, justice, common good, public interests, rather than counter-terrorism. And say, you know, if black people had opted for counter-terrorism, there would mean no such thing as American democracy. There'd be terrorist cells everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. You see. Instead of Martin King, black version of Bin Laden. Can you imagine that? Now, we got black gangsters. Gangsters come in all colors. You know that. <laughs> but most of the black gangsters in Chocolate Hood shooting each other. Tied to underground market. Drugs and so forth and so on. That's the worst of any people. Every group has gangsters. Sometimes they can even be elected officials. <laughs> it's true. We all have gangster proclivities. And there might be some saints here, y'all. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I've always thought that saints were just sinners who look at the world through the lens of the heart anyway. Just trying to love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. That's all we're trying to do. <laughs> W.H. Auden is right. But the fact of see, opting for that love and justice, the Socratic and the prophetic, sometimes I say to my white brothers, so when you see Negroes, you ought to just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> oh, we want to thank you all for producing the Martin Kings and Curtis Mayfields and Aretha's and Stevie Wonders and A. Philip Randolph's and Sojourner Truths. You didn't have to do that. You didn't. And it's an interesting experiment, isn't it? Can you imagine if black people had dominated white brothers and sisters of white ministers standing up and saying, we're going to love our enemies. We're going to love these Negroes who have been lynching us all this time. Now, I have great confidence in white brothers and sisters under certain circumstances. But that's a fascinating thought experiment. And a lot of it has to do with the depth of one's commitment to what love and justice is all about. It's no plaything. Even when you're losing, it's a noble cause. And Brother Martin used to say what? I would rather lose with my integrity and dignity than win and be a thug and a gangster like these folk who are killing these precious little babies. That's a moral leap. That's a spiritual leap. And that's what, for me, vocation is all about. That's my tradition. That's what the memoir is about. That I intend to be faithful unto death of that fusion of Socratic questioning and, and prophetic witness with the tragic comic sensibility of the blues, the blues idiom. And I, in the end, I think that every fragile democratic experiment predicated on the deep questioning, the courage to think, the deep witness, keeping track of the humanity of everybody, our gay brothers and lesbian sisters not allowing them to be demonized and trashed 
as if somehow they're outside of the human family. Or the precious children who don't have a voice politically, but who constitute 100% of the future. What a challenge. I thank God at Pepperdine University, even alongside this beautiful, beautiful body of water, as a commitment to paideia in the broadest sense. And in that way, my vocation overlaps with what the vocation of this institution is all about. Thank you all so very much. And we'll open it up for questions and queries. And we'll open up for questions and queries. Thank you so much. We'll take as much time as you like. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for your patience. Though. We'll take a few more questions. Please don't hesitate. Jump right in. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Wait till the microphone gets to you so others can hear the question. Dr. West, thank you so much for uh, being here at Pepperdine. Could you say something more about how the risen Jesus Christ has met you in your own deep education? Yeah, I appreciate that, my dear brother. Uh, it was actually in Shiloh Baptist Church where I decided to make Jesus my choice because I had experienced uh, a transformation from my gangster proclivities, which were dominant. I still have gangster proclivities. It just under control by the Holy Ghost, you know. <laughs> you don't know what, what I end up doing. That's why I want you to pray for me. You see what I mean? But they were dominant. And I experienced a genuine change and transformation that resulted in a, a change in my disposition, a change in my perception. And that change was real. Uh, and, I, uh, and as I deepened my faith, I could see how that change was unfolding over time as I encountered moments of joy, moments of catastrophe, moments of delight, moments of the sublime, as well as moments of sadness and sorrow. And I was, I, I'm thoroughly convinced that being a Christian generates a form of joy, joy in loving others, a joy in serving others. And it's a joy that is beyond description, you see, beyond description. And I can't conceive of trying to be in the world any other way in that sense. And uh, in my encounters at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and so forth, I would be presented with some very, very powerful arguments uh, against Christian faith and religious faith and so forth. And I like to wrestle with the most powerful arguments. I think the most crucial text here would be David Hume. Again, David Hume was my soul brother. Uh, uh, his dialogues on natural religion. I don't think there's, in the English language, a more powerful set of arguments that you'll find that attempt to undermine Christian faith. And David Hume pushes me against the wall every time I read it. This way Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor in some way does too, you see. But that strengthens my faith even by being pushed against the wall. Because no matter how strong those arguments are, in the end, I don't find them thoroughly persuasive. They're just strong arguments. <laughs> and sometimes you want to wrestle with your critics. You know, Nietzsche used to say you're only as strong as your critics. He said, if you want high quality thought, then get some high quality critics. Some marriages like that, but we won't go into. <laughs> Bond together. Oh, you love me because you think I'm wrong all the time. I understand that. That makes me stronger and makes me right. In a better way, because I've had to counter your claims. But it was precisely that early experience and then, of course, a lifetime. Now, part of this has to do with, and this is Pascal's point, of course, that it helps to uh, try to hang around with a lot of high-quality Christians. You remember Pascal's argument, if you really want to be initiated, you had to just start hanging around folk who were taking the faith seriously. Now that means you had to be very discerning in your judgment. 
very discerning in your judgment. But when I talk about Brother Tavis, he said, Brother Tavis and I wrestle all the time with our Christian faith. He grew up Pentecostal, I grew up Baptist. Now for some folk, that no difference at all, that's not true. <laughs> He's got a distinctive tradition, I got mine. But um, uh, more than anything else, it's, it, it, it is a series of, uh, of, of tests and testimonies that reinforce it. And uh, um, you want to come back? Modern well, I think that he would um, be very uh, sensitive to any form of self-righteousness, any forms of idolatry, and any forms of attempting to convince persons to treasure something other than what the cross and the temple and the empty tomb. That's true, not just for the university, that's true for our business, that's true for families. I mean, a way, the interesting question for me in a certain sense is what do you think about the churches that claim you? Paul died. Well, that would be something. He's got to come to the church and say, 18 before he's even crossed. What's going on in my name? What kind of gospel are you preaching in there? Blessings here. Let's make a deal with God. Give me, give me, give me. He said, oh, this sounds like a very market-driven Christianity, this prosperity gospel, this chamber of commerce religion. What has that got to do with my life? You see what I mean? I said, very much so. But I mean, I can't speak for Jesus now. You know that. As cracked a vessel as I am, I can't speak for Jesus. But the Jesus that I know in my life pushes me in that direction. Back to the humanity, humility, and always being suspicious of the idolatrous pro proclivities that I have in my own heart, mind, and soul. Uh, uh, and I think in the end, of course, you know, he would acknowledge that we all fall short. But it doesn't mean that we fall equally. You see, I mean, the Ku Klux Klan's Jesus needs some funkification. Because <laughs> their white supremacy tends to downplay the love flow. You say, love thy neighbor, but not Negroes, not Jews, not a lot of Catholics, not too many well-to-do. Well, who's left, Johnson? You and your cousin? <laughs> Is that what love thy neighbor? Got that little circumscribed? You see what I mean? But you see, I'm the kind of black man and I'm the kind of Christian where I actually have a love for the Ku Klux Klan as children of God made in the image of God who have the potential to change. And I have white comrades who have parents who were once members of the Klan. And I have white comrades, I'm old enough to have even some folks who used to be in the Klan. Which means what? If every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. You see? Change can take place. You know. Now you say, well, Brother West, if you're in a foxhole, you think you can depend on that post-Ku Klux Klan Christian? I said, well, give me Tavis at that point, you know, because you, you got to have somebody got a history you can rely on. But no, I think we all can change for the better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I use the Klan to be a bit facetious, but I mean, you know, racism comes in a lot of subtle forms. You don't have to wear a sheet uh, for it to still be at work in terms of arrogance, condescension, and so on, you see. But I appreciate your question, my brother. I would ask even the same question to you if we had time to go back and forth, but I think we probably have, have other questions here. Uh, please don't hesitate. We got the microphone now. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, we've got the microphone right there. There we go. Hi, my name is Danielle Ray. Thank you for your time and sharing um, your advice with us. But one piece of advice I'm interested in for us young students is uh, what, you could, um, what piece of advice you could give for us for all of the young students here and our journeys through our educational career. Oh, I mean, I think it has something to do with this, this sense of calling and vocation I was talking about, being committed to paideia. 
I think the, the, the market model of education is what? You come to Pepperdine, gain access to skills, try to get a dynamite job and live, some, live in some vanilla supper. <laughs> no, that's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. We're talking about what it means to be human. What kind of love connection? What kind of... And it has little to do with being colorblind. I know there's a lot of discourse these days about colorblind, you see. But for Christians, we're supposed to be love struck, not colorblind. And you can't love folk if you don't see their bodies. When you hug them, you're not hugging the platonic form. No, 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 no. We are embodied creatures. Embodied creatures. And love struck means what? Embracing in a critical mode, though. In a critical mode. I mean, you got a white brothers and sisters that may have been deeply influenced by black music, but never touched a Negro before. You got some learning to do, right? Why? Because there's certain nuanced ways of responding and speaking and so forth, and we learn from one another. And you do that by embracing a love struck. By embrace is not an uncritical embrace. All of us are in need of. Development, growth, maturation. But we need context where we're able to be vulnerable enough with one another to take a risk and learn. And that's always a challenge. Vulnerability is always difficult. It's always very, very difficult. In this age of Obama, it becomes even more so because with that tremendous breakthrough, of my dear brother Barack Obama, people think that now we've got this black man in the White House with his precious family. Thank God we've taken care of the race problem now. <laughs> Whew, I'm glad we pulled that one off. I don't want to hear nothing from these Negroes for the next hundred years. <laughs> Just look in the White House, look in the White House, look who's in there. <laughs> and I'm being facetious, but you all get the point. It's a great breakthrough. It's a great breakthrough, but it doesn't mean America is post-racist. It just means that white brothers and sisters are less racist than their parents and grandparents used to be. That's worth acknowledging. That's very important. But to move from racist to less racist doesn't mean you give out moral prizes. It's just a nice thing to be less racist. <laughs> That's crucial. Because, I mean, after Obama was elected, you got some white brothers and sisters just walking around with a smile, just smiling at Negroes at will. <laughs> Don't you feel happy? How come you're not so happy? I am happy, but I'm still living in decrepit housing. I still got levels of unemployment, underemployment. The bullets are still flying. I appreciate your election, but let's work together to deal with some of these problems. Then when you look at Obama's economic team, do they have any history of being concerned with poor people and working people? Hardly at all. Brother Barack, what are you doing? Why are you so mesmerized by the Wall Street crowd? How come you're so seduced by the establishment? Or is it that now your president is hard for you to follow through on that democratic rhetoric with your technocratic policies? Got a health care plan and celebrating that excludes 27 million. Well, we got 47. Yeah, that's progress. That's true. That's, well, that's understandable. Politics is a process of concessions. But Malcolm X used to say what? You don't stab folk in the back nine inches and pull it out six inches and celebrate progress? <laughs> even as black president, even as president who's supposed to be liberal, progressive, or whatever, there's no doubt he's brilliant and charismatic now, you see. And that's a nice thing, but I would think, especially for myself as a Christian, I'm never impressed just by smartness and braininess and brilliance and charisma. I want to know what kind of courage you have, what kind of backbone you have, what are you willing to stand for, what line in the sand do you draw? You give $787 billion to investment bankers and you can't account for a lot of the money, and yet when you gave $1 billion for poor children, you said that's a step towards socialism. Socialized medicine, that's nothing but hypocrisy. It shows your priorities. You got an economic model in which poor people and working people are just an afterthought. 
It's like celebrating the recession is over and recovery setting in. What do you think was recovered if you got 10% of your population still unemployed and many half a million not even looking for jobs anymore and 30% unemployment in chocolate cities? And talk about the recovery is now expanding and the recession is over. What lens do you look at the world, White House? And they said, well, Brother West, you went all over the country supporting Barack Obama, didn't you? 55 different events. How come you so critical? I'm the same Negro Christian now as I was then. I said exactly the same thing. We just needed to bring to a close an administration that, to put it charitably, hadn't done wise things in regard to poor people. <laughs> you see? You see what I mean? And we can have a long debate on, you know, George Bush's great breakthroughs in regard to support for the poor. Uh, uh, because we had to be open-minded about this thing. I'm not being facetious. Not at all. But, uh, uh, but the point is, is that I don't know of any politician, whatever color, whatever gender, whatever sexual orientation, who does not stand under the judgment of the cross. Any part of the world. Any part of the world. You see. It doesn't mean you don't critically support candidates. You see. But it means in the end there's always going to be some Socratic energy that needs to be put forward in terms of critique. And most importantly, we have to try to live certain kinds of lives and bear witness in such a way that we bring power and pressure to bear. I know I'm going on too long. We got some other questions. Other question. Are you going to wait for the mic? You know, maybe what we could do, let's just have three questions in a row. I will say nothing until the end of the three so that uh, uh, we get some more voices. I'm sorry to go on so long. Obama gets me excited. <laughs> I'm so, so disappointed in that, brother. But uh, I pray for him because his safety is still something that's very real. And, uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little sick. You, I, did wanna, right. I wanted to ask you, um, as a young person that I'm currently a community organizer and I love um, going into certain communities, how, what advice would you give for somebody that is trying to empower those that have been disempowered for so long or without a voice? How do you um, inspire them to want to do better for their lives? I appreciate that question. It definitely. God bless you what you're doing. Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, I am an educator with the LA Unified School District. I work with wayward boys, and I have begun to almost give up on their gangbanging and the alcoholism and the drug use, and they do not care. They say, Miss Mack, I'm not doing this. Shit. I'm not interested in it. F this stuff and F you. And I'm, I'm to the point where, I mean, I've always had this this unconditional love and, and, and agape love for, for my people, and I don't mean African Americans, I mean human beings, mm -hmm. but it's wearing thin. And last night I saw you yeah. in West Hollywood, and I felt revived, I felt renewed. I tapped in again to this you know, agape love and this endless well of caring, but when I went into work today, I looked around and I just felt hopeless all over again, and I thought to myself, how do you begin to make these kids care? They're in group homes, mothers on drugs, fathers dead, mothers dead, fathers in the penitentiary. I wonder if you would consider making a video, a DVD for kids, for children, to inspire them like you inspired me yesterday. And, and it did last, and I'm going to read your books, but I, I'd like to see that. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good, absolutely. Thank you so much for that heartfelt. Uh, that's a nice brim you got there, brother. I'm telling you that. That looks sharp, man, I'm telling you. That looks sharp. No, because see, you know, style and elegance is part of the tradition I'm talking about, too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. i also like to uh, thank you for your words of wisdom, um, blessing this community with your words of wisdom. Um, but I also were, I once read that you compared the 9-11 uh, tragedy to the black community, or the, ba the black struggle. I'd just like to know, how do they compare? Mm, no, I appreciate it. Wow, we've got some questions here. That's all right. No, Pepper Dime is all right. 
uh, is community organizing. Um, I mean, one, I, I think it's important to, uh, to read some of the great community organizers, people like Miles Horton. You all know who Miles Horton was. He's one of the greatest community organizers of the 20th century. He founded a place called Highlander Center where a courageous sister named Rosa Parks spent weeks in the fall of 1955, right before she sat down in order to stand up for justice on a bus in Montgomery. Miles Horton was a white brother whose mother went to the second grade. Many of his cousins are in the Ku Klux Klan in Tennessee. And he decided to follow his mother who even with the second grade education told her that when Jesus had loved thy neighbor, it included black people at that time, Negroes or colored people. And that was a revolutionary act and Miles believed it. And he went on to University of Tennessee, he went to Union Theological Seminary and studied with one of the great intellectual volcanoes of the 20th century named Reinhold Niebuhr. And he went back from Union Seminary to Tennessee and founded Highlander Center. In fact, his wife was one of the uh, uh, composers of the song, We Shall Overcome. You all know that song. They sing that song in every corner of the globe. Miles Horton wrote a book, autobiography, called The Long Haul. And that's a text to read. Because as a community organizer, the same way if you're going to be a jazz musician, you can play the piano where you better listen to some Art Tatum and some James P. Johnson and some Duke and some Oscar Peterson, and even read about their lives as to how they went about it. Community organizers, you want to read these great community organizers. Paulo Fieri would be another one. Bell Hooks would be another one. There's a whole, there's a, there's, I mean, you don't want to read perennially so you never get back to organizing, don't get me wrong. But <laughs> you want to balance back and forth, to and fro. But you want to read how they went about it with this spirit of openness, learning from the people you organize, having a patience so that persons who you think are not changing quick enough could be you yourself expecting it because they're in different stages of their lives and so forth and so on. And then seeing the, break, the breakthrough, of course, Saul Alinsky is somebody who's also worth reading, uh, um, who Hillary Clinton wrote a dis her senior thesis on Saul Alinsky, which is quite interesting at Wellesley, but this is in the 60s. She's undergone her changes too. Uh, God bless them. We, we had nothing against the sister, but. She's far removed from Alinsky at this point. Uh, uh, but it's th those community organizers are worth reading because uh, um, right now it would probably be Ernesto Cortez and the, the IAF, the Industrial Areas Foundation, are probably the most significant community organizing that's going on in um, various parts of the country. Um, now when it comes to the young brothers, and this could be true for anybody, uh, you see, when you have generations of material poverty, this is true anywhere. It could be in Australia, it could be in Russia, it could be in Japan. You know. When you have three and four generations of material deprivation, where well, the schools are just dilapidated and they, the streets are, are, uh, lack elegance and lack any sense of inspiration, uh, or your fathers, too many fathers are drifting. Some of them downright irresponsible. Mothers overworked and underpaid. You're bombarded by market culture, prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. And yet you broke as the Ten Commandments financially. Generation after generation with guns available, drugs flowing. That produces gangster activity. And there's a sense in which uh, I like to keep track as much of the young people in those circumstances who opt not to be gangsters, given the limited opportunities that they have, emotionally, materially, educationally. But, and I've seen it, teaching prisons for 32 years. I mean, you talk to the prisoners 15 years ago and they see the young folk coming through and they can't get too close. Because they got a cold heartedness and a mean spiritedness with that stare, you know. You all know the difference between a stare and vision, right? That stare is flat. It's, it's cold. 
I've had so many young brothers these days, they, won't, you, they will never look you in the eyes because the eyes are the windows of the soul. And their souls are so thoroughly scarred and wounded, they don't trust anybody. So I was like, brother, I could, can you just look at my face though, brother? I want to look dead in your eyes. No, I don't do that. Because <laughs> they've been hurt too much. Player hated too much. Violated too much. Flagellated too much. No one can stand but so much. And neglected. And then often targeted in terms of stereotypes and of course back to police power. Police try to keep track of the gangsters, those who rape and murder and so forth need to go to jail. 62% of young brothers in jail are in there for what? Soft drug convictions. 62%. I tell my dear brothers and sisters at Princeton, I say, I know some of you all are flying high in the friendly skies now. <laughs> Not here at Pepperdine, but at Princeton, eh, we've seen some, right, Brother Nate? <laughs> Not Nate, but the others. <laughs> <laughs> we've seen, I said, we've seen them. If the police enforce the drug activity at Princeton at the same level of intensity as they do in the Black Hood in LA, the jails would be more colorful. 62% soft drugs? And once you get locked into that prison subculture, what happens? It can devour you, a lot of those young folk. And that's much of what they know. And of course, you see the styles, the baggy pants and so forth come out of the prison culture mediated through hip hop styles and so forth and so on but they're still struggling. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, when you and I look at those young brothers and you see that stare and we want them to have a vision, because vision's biblical, isn't it? Somewhere we read, where there is no vision, the people perish, the parents with stares. We have to keep in mind that um, there was a brother named Malcolm Little who was just like that. He needed love, care, and concern. Once he got it, he came out of the block smoking Malcolm X. Elijah Muhammad loved that Negro into a new self mediated with Allah. And of course, he outgrew Elijah Muhammad. He said, Elijah, you're talking about loving black people. How come you're not loving white folk? No, I'm going to start with these black people first. They hate themselves. But don't you think it needs to spill over? Well, I'm not big on spill over in that regard. <laughs> Now, as a Christian, we, we got to believe in spillover. We loving everybody. But you don't love everybody and hate yourself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. He was dealing with black folk who had taught to, to hate themselves. And a lot of these young folk bombarded with deep forms of self-hatred and self-violation and self-destruction, you see. And in fact, in my own memoir, and I'm no Malcolm, believe me, you. Uh, not at all. Uh, uh, if Malcolm is Aretha, then uh, I would like to be Anita Baker. Because <laughs> I'm not at the same level. But I got a song to sing the way Anita does. But you can't sing it like Aretha. You see. But you see, in my book, I was like those brothers too. I got kicked out of school in third grade. No school would take me in the whole Sacramento district. But my mama didn't give up on me. My church didn't. They said, he's got problems, but we think this little Negro has potential. We don't know what impact we have. My hunch is, is that you have tremendous impact. It's just that your love is such that you want to save all of them. And you plant seeds. And sometimes you don't live long enough to see how they sprout. But just keep planting those seeds. Keep planting those seeds. Just like the parable of the sower, right? We don't necessarily see the harvest, but you keep planting those seeds, nevertheless. Because in the end, ours is in the trying. The rest is not our business. 9 11, y'all end with 9 11. Yeah, now 9 11, uh, actually, I was there in New York uh, when it took place, and oh my God, I tell you, I never forget, I was there supporting uh, our brother Freddie, who was running for mayor, going to be the first Latino mayor of New York City. The election was that day. Freddie Ferrer was his name, I'll never forget. And uh, I was on the top floor of the Marriott, and I'd heard on the radio 
they were, that uh, one plane had gone into uh, the hit World Trade Center. And I looked out and saw the second plane. And they thought it would actually hit Times Square. I was in Times Square. You're on the Marriott Hotel, you know, right there in Times Square. Mm -hmm. So they had police that had protected Times Square just to see whether there were other planes or people dropping bombs or whatever. And uh, when given my death shutter and so forth, I mean, I'm always ready to die because I, I lived a magnificent life and I death can't steal none of my joy and love. You know what I mean? So I'm always ready. I'm ever ready. <laughs> Uh, that's true. And then after all the death threats and so forth, anyway, every day that you get used to that, somebody like myself. <laughs> but uh, um, the thing that hit me was that I was, I said, good God, here's another vicious cycle of violence and bigotry, killing innocent people. How cowardly, you know. I said, there are going to be large numbers of fellow citizens who believe for the first time that they uh, that they are, they lack protection. You see, they'll feel for the first time that they are vulnerable to vicious attack. Uh, and for the first time, they'll feel that terrorism has now visited their lives and the American experience. And I said, my God, you know, to be black in America under slavery, Jim Crow and Jane Crow was in a different way and yet still subject to random violence, subject to being attacked, you see. That there's a sense in which so long in American history to control black people was to keep black people so afraid and so intimidated, not knowing when the violence would hit, not knowing when one could be terrorized psychically, socially, or physically. I said, for the first time, large numbers of white brothers and sisters are going to get a toast or a touch, sadly, of what it is to be niggerized. Because to be niggerized is to keep people so afraid and intimidated, subject to a violence that could come anywhere at any time. And as you can imagine, based on what I said in my presentation, it means that those who have been talking about Negrization for a long time have to raise their backs up and say, let's talk even in this moment about love and justice, not about revenge. The first response to terrorization, the first response of the U.S. government to 9-11, was it love and justice? We're going to hunt them down like cockroaches? Stamp them out? Well, I thought in democracies you brought people to court and the rule of law. That, that distinguishes democratic regimes from non-democratic regimes. You see? That's, what, that's what black folk did. We know Johnson and company lynched my uncle. Do you go blow up his house? No. You bring him to court and make your case. Because if it's just all about revenge, eye for an eye, end up blind. Tooth for a tooth, end up toothless. Just reinforcing the same cycle. Violence, 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 violence. You need a rule of law for some nonviolent adjudication, even in the most horrendous and catastrophic of circumstances. So I looked around. I said, where are the voices of love and justice? Or is justice just revenge? Was Shakespeare wrong in The Merchant of Venice? We argued the qualitative difference between justice and revenge. And Portia's poration, you all know what I'm talking about. And he's dealing with anti-Semitism in that text, wasn't he? The anti-Jewish. Hatred shot through so much of Christian civilizations, you see. And that's what I was looking for. And that's very much what I had in mind when I was talking about the ways in which we can learn from a people who have been terrorized, given the fact that after 9-11, most Americans felt in some way affected by that kind of vicious terrorizing attack by gangsters, you see. no doubt about that. But it's not new for the American experience in terms of being terrorized. So much to learn.
from each other. Thank you all so very much. Thank you.